Hi, this is David Swanson from WarIsACrime.org, and John Horgan has written a book called The End of War, uh, which I highly recommend, uh, along with my own book, War is a Lie, and others. And uh, John's book has uh, inspired Brian Lair of WNYC to begin a discussion of the question, is war inevitable? Uh, and I was asked to give this contribution. So here's my answer, and I'll, I'll give 10 reasons why I say no, war is not inevitable. Number one, war is new. This species of ours has been around for many thousands, millions of years, and war goes back about 12,000 years in some recognizable form. So it's not how we evolved. It's not built into our bodies or our brains. It's not a joint inheritance of ours and the chimpanzees. In fact, I'm not sure you can pin it on the chimpanzees at all. Uh, number two, it's sporadic. It's not across the board. Some complex sedentary societies developed war, others didn't. Uh, some had war and then lost it again and brought it back again. It's, it's scattered. You'll be told, oh, well, there's almost always been a war somewhere in the world. Well, let me tell you this. There has always been peace many somewheres in the world. Number, t number three, war has changed so dramatically just in the past decades and centuries, what we call war has changed so dramatically that arguably we've ended war and started something new and called that by the same name a number of times. Uh, during the Civil War, the rich folks would ride out with their umbrellas and picnics to watch the battle for the day, which would be off for the night, of course. Come World War I, you're lining up people in trenches who get picked off with machine guns if they stick their heads up, and clouds of poison gas are lofting across, uh, and they're there for months and months to win 10 feet of earth. Uh, war became something very different that you wouldn't go with a picnic to watch. Uh, we now have wars fought from computer screens in Virginia or Nevada halfway around the globe with robots flying through the heavens to launch war on other nations. Uh, and people could, the rich folks could all watch that from their televisions, except it's not shown to us because we wouldn't approve, because war has become more associated than ever with what it is, murder. And, and so the idea of a hundred years back, uh, William James' idea that we needed a moral equivalent of war to replace it, that we needed some other outlet to, to exercise courage and risk and solidarity and sacrifice if we weren't going to have war, it's no longer relevant. The, the, the values of war, war makes people immoral. War makes our culture immoral. The moral equivalent, what James was looking for, is in Tahrir Square, Cairo, Egypt, is on the streets of Bahrain right this minute, is in the capital of Wisconsin and the Occupy encampments. There is where people will come home talking about life-changing experiences, sacrifice, solidarity, risk, and and inspiration the way people like to still pretend you can talk about war. The moral equivalent of war, the moral superior to war, is in the struggle to save our natural environment, representative government, control of our lives, rather than domination by a corporate wealthy elite. That's where the struggle is today and it is nonviolent and it uses tools that are even newer than war tools that are extremely new to change the world using nonviolence in ways that are more effective, more successful than war could ever be. So that no matter what justification you might give for launching a war, there is a better way on war's own terms to do it. And it's called nonviolent action. Number four, nations have ended war. Continents have ended war, cultures have ended war, nations have limited war, have restricted weapons, and we've made specific decisions to step back from wars we were told were inevitable. You can take the exact same situations and use them as an excuse for war or as a small difficulty to be negotiated around with war to be avoided and truly treated as a last resort, meaning you never get to it. So when the Soviet Union shoots down a plane, 
we don't go to war. But George W. Bush dreams up a scheme to send the same kind of plane over Iraq in hopes of getting it shot down so that we can start a war. War is a choice that is made, and there is always the choice not to go to war. Number five, war is unpopular and increasingly unpopular. It is not where we look for heroism and glory anymore. It is not something we desire. It is always talked about as a last resort, always disguised as defense, always sold as humanitarian or uh, as a protection against a magical sort of evil conspiracy that can get us uh, in, in mysterious ways. Uh, war is something that has to be driven by lies and Increasingly, it's not lies but silence. We are taken into wars secretly, without our knowledge, because wars are so unpopular. I mean, this is not brand new. Our biggest wars we've gone into under presidents who got elected promising to keep us out. But it is growing. The unpopularity of war is expanding rapidly. And you would think if war was buried in our nature and inevitable, that we would suffer from this lack of war. We wouldn't despise war. We would long for it. We would have post-traumatic stress disorder from the absence of war rather than having difficulty ever recovering from the experience of war. That looks like something contrary to our nature. Number six, talk of human nature for many centuries was talk of male human nature. Women were not part of war. Women in a significant way, very, very recently, are becoming a part of war. But if it's not inevitable, if women can go that way, why can't men go the other way? Why can't men stop war? Well, war clearly is not female nature. It's not male nature. It's not human nature. It may be corporate war profiteer nature, but there's no such thing as these natures. Life is what we choose to make it. Number seven, war for over a century has made no economic sense on its own terms whatsoever. Right? We're not taking slaves or territory or loot. That war does not benefit the conquering nation as a whole or the corporate structure of the conquering nation as a whole. War benefits, if anyone, in the short term, profiteers from war, resource controlling, corporations, war cleanup operations, a very small segment of, of the corporate world of the conquering nation, which as a whole tends to suffer dramatically in the process. Right? So war is not just immoral. War is, is a destructive force economically. It's not a jobs program. Right? It is hollowing out our economy when investment on the scale of war or on any scale, in any other industry, or even in tax breaks for ordinary people, would be better for our economy than war, successful or otherwise. Number eight, violence of all kinds is decreasing, and that decrease is accelerating. Over the past centuries and decades, violence of all kinds is going away. Gone is slavery. Gone is acceptance of family blood feuds. Gone is dueling as an acceptable way to settle individual disputes. Gone is child abuse. Not gone, but diminished, rendered unacceptable, outside the norm of respectable behavior, spanking of children, raising and training animals of all sorts with violence fist fights in the street. Violence of all kinds is being driven out of our culture and international violence along with it. These are very, very positive trends that have huge hurdles yet to overcome, but they suggest quite clearly that there is not something inevitable about violence. Number nine, and this I, this I draw heavily on John Horgan's book, war is a meme. War is a cultural product. You cannot, you cannot correlate statistically the likelihood of war with 
population density or resource scarcity or any other factor that supposedly is going to serve as a grand historical force outside of our control that makes wars happen. No, wars happen if cultures accept wars. Either, and these are important distinctions that I, I wish that John had hit on more in his book, either because a culture actually wants war, war is popular, war is desired, war is glorious, or because a culture that is not served by a representative government tolerates war sufficiently that that government makes war happen. That is the situation we are in, which, which leads into number 10. War is a central mechanism through which 99% of us transfer our wealth and our power and our decision-making ability to that incredible elite. War profiteers are the 1% of the 1%. This is not a question of just the banksters on Wall Street. This is not a situation in which we can ignore the puppets in Washington. Those puppets are making conscious, deliberate choices to be bribed and controlled. And they are controlled by the war profiteers in Northern Virginia and around the country, as well as the banksters. And the two are part and parcel, and in many cases, the same individuals. We are taking on a corporate elite power structure internationally that is driven by a military industrial complex as much as anything else, cannot survive without it cannot be defeated with it remaining intact. This is, this is a question at this point as we face the erosion of civil liberties and representative government, the concentration of wealth and power, the destruction of the natural environment through which our biggest polluter and destroyer is in fact the military, and the blowback, the animosity, the hostility, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We are not talking about making the world a more pleasant place by giving peace a chance. We are talking about surviving. Either war ends or we end. And there is a movement growing in the streets across the world that is going to end corporate oligarchic power, pretense of democracy, open dictatorship, and the making of war for no reason other than war itself and the profit of a few greedy individuals. This movement has every chance in the world of succeeding. It is growing, it is having successes, and there is absolutely nothing biological, environmental, historical, magical, religious, inevitable, or political that can stop us. Only our own decision to stop. And right now, I don't see that happening. We're survivors. This species is not going out. Not right now.